Uh, welcome to our Friday seminars, the one before our spring break. So just to hold you, hold you up for a bit more. Um, so today, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Su Shi from University of Michigan. Uh, Shu is an assistant professor there at the Department of uh, Biostatistics, and she got her PhD from uh, University of Washington, Seattle, Biostatistics, and then took a quick detour to Boston for a postdoc at the Harvard Data Science Initiative. And now she's in Michigan. Uh, she does a lot of interesting work in various areas, uh, especially in general statistical methods for understanding and analyzing complex healthcare, administrative healthcare databases like EHR and claims data. And she does a lot of interesting and impactful work in causal inference as well, especially dealing with the issue of unmeasured confounders. And she has, she's also a co-leader of the causal inference core of FDS Sentinel Initiative, which uh, monitors, I think, safety of FDA regulated products. Right. And today she's going to tell us about some of her interesting recent work on so-called proximal causal inference with synthetic controls in time varying data. So please join me in welcoming Shu. Thank you so much, Dr. Chai. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here in person and meet with you all. Um, I have been super excited about this trip because it's been three years since I ever traveled by airplane. And of course, I forgot all my charters and I realized at the airport. So if I look super nervous, it is true because it's been a long time and I haven't been, you know, standing in front of actual human beings, uh, not talking to a wall or, you know, wearing actual pants. So we'll see how it goes. So today I'm going to talk about some of our recent work on uh, uh, area called synthetic control. And this is joint work with my student Meng Tong Hu and my wonderful collaborators, Dr. Wang Miao and Dr. Eric Chekun Chekun. So if you don't work in the field of economics or uh, policy research, you might not have heard of this term synthetic control, but in fact, it's a very impactful line of research that's frequently used in, uh, by policymakers. A simple Google Scholar search will show you that. So the second one, oops. Uh, sorry, getting used to this. The second paper here the, is a seminal work in 2010 by Dr. Abadi and others, and this has been highly cited. In, in fact, this is one of the most cited paper in JASA. And in the year of 2017, Dr. Asi and Inbens um, referred to synthetic control as the most important innovation in the policy evaluation uh, literature in the 15 years. So this has been a very popular uh, methodology uh, used by policymakers. And so here's a um, motivating example. In the year of 2019, uh, the East and West Germany, they reunified and become one country after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And this is the first time in history that a capitalist and a socialist economy has suddenly become one. So of course, it has a huge impact on both sides. In the past 30 years, there have been a lot of studies looking at the impact on West and East Germany. One particular such research is done in 2015 by Dr. Abadi and others, where they collected annual country level, so aggregated to the country level panel data between uh, 1960 to 2006. And they collected data not only on West Germany, the, the treated country, the impacted country, but also on 16 other control, quote unquote, control countries that are assumed to be unimpacted by the German reunification. So here's how the data look like. In this figure on the x-axis are time in years. And 1990 is when reunification happened. So prior to that is the pre-treatment period. After that is the post-treatment period. The y-axis is our outcome of interest per capita GDP. The black solid line is the outcome trajectory for West Germany, the one that's impacted by reunification. Whereas we also have 16 gray, I'm not sure if you can see it. These are, there are 16 gray dotted lines that indicates the outcome for the 16 control countries. Typically in causal inference, you will see that there are a bunch of people who are treated and then people who are given control. However, this is a setting that's very special where you only have one single treated unit and a bunch of control units. And the question is, how can I estimate the causal effect of German reunification on the treated unit, which is West Germany? 
this is actually one of my favorite example to talk about causal inference because it makes the notion of potential outcome very straightforward. So let's think about this. How would I estimate the causal effect? Naively, I can just take the mean outcome in the post-treatment period, take the mean outcome in the pre-treatment period, take the difference. But that's of course flawed because over time, a lot of things have changed, such as you know economy, education, technology, and those can also have an impact on GDP. So the question is, how can I disentangle those time varying factors from uh, German reunification such that I can, you know, go down to, you know, target just one, the causal effect due to this one single factor, which is uni reunification. The idea is I want to create a clone of West Germany, uh, you know, a twin West Germany that has never been impacted by reunification. In another word, I want to get a West Germany in a hypothetical world where German reunification never happened. And then if I have that, then in the post-treatment period, I can just take the contrast between the actual West Germany and the cloned version of West Germany. That will give me the causal effect because I know that any difference that, uh, that I observe between the two West Germanys had to be caused by reunification because everything else is exactly the same. So that is the idea of potential outcome framework to estimate the causal effect. So how do we do that? One idea is, well, in the post-treatment period, although I don't observe the outcome under no treatment for West Germany, I do observe the outcome for the other countries who are not impacted by reunification. So I can just take the average of the 16 control countries and take that as a clone of West Germany. Of course, adjusting for the baseline differences in the pre-treatment period. This has been refer referred to as the difference in differences uh, method. The problem is there's a key assumption required for this method called the parallel trend, which says because it's a clone, it better be very similar in the pre-treatment period when nobody is ever impacted by treatment because treatment hasn't uh, happened yet. So in this period, the DID method requires that the uh, trajectory for the actual West Germany need to be evolved in parallel with the, uh, you know, the average of the control units, which you can see that it's not really true for our real data. So there's a violation of the parallel trend assumption. To relax this assumption in the seminal work in 2010 that we just saw with thousands of citations, Dr. Abadis and others, they proposed the synthetic control method. Whoops. The synthetic control method. So basically, instead of calculating a direct average of the control countries, I'm going to calculate a weighted average, and that's referred to as the synthetic control, which is the, you know, the clone West Germany. And I can tune the weights such that in the pre-treatment period, I can make sure that I got a really good clone in the sense that, so here's a little spoiler, the red line is the synthetic West Germany. And I can tune the weight such that in the pre-treatment period, they're almost on top of each other. Then after the reunification happens, they start to diverge and I can just take the difference between the red and black curve. That gives me the causal effect from German reunification. So very simple idea, how do I create a good clone of the treated unit? Leveraging the 16 control units. Now, formally, let me introduce some notation. Suppose we observe uh, six, sorry, n plus one units at T time points in the German reunification uh, situation. N is the number of controls. So in total, we have 17 countries and uh, T is around 40. So we use I to index the units. Uh, unit zero is the treated unit. Unit one through N is the control units. And we use T to index time. When T is less than T0, that's the pre-treatment period, and after T0 is the post-treatment period. In the, in the past few, like about, about 20 years, there have been a lot of synthetic control methods proposed, and they're under different regimes. Um, the seminal work in 2010, it actually considered a finite sample bound for the bias. So in the scenario where none of the number of units or time um, diverge, and they, uh, and then some people consider the scenario where we have a large number of units. Some people consider the scenario where I have a large number of time points. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on the scenario where we consider a large, large T regime. So that's where we're uh, living in. Okay, 
The classical synthetic control method commonly assumes something called the interactive fixed effect model. This is something that I'm going to go back and forth and keep talking about it so you better remember what it looked like. So it's very complicated. I wish I could write it. I should have write, written it before my talk on the board, but let's see. So we use yt to denote the outcome for the treated unit at time point t, and we use wit to denote the outcome for the ice control unit at time point t. And for the treated unit, it's equal to xt beta t plus mu zero transpose lambda t plus epsilon zero t. So a lot of terms, but they actually have a very clean structure here. xt is a binary indicator for treatment. You can almost ignore it because pr prior to t zero is always zero. After t zero is always one. So just one indication for pre and post treatment. Beta t is the time varying coefficient for treatment. In such a linear additive model, you will see later this is actually just the causal effect, although it's not generally hold. So we'll, as we extend to nonlinear models later, you will see that the causal effect does not correspond to a particular regression coefficient. This is the part that is the troublemaker. So lambda t is a time varying latent factor. Like I said, there, globally, there might be changes over time in terms of economy, technology, and they all have an impact on GDP. But I don't get to fully observe them or account for them. So these are latent time varying factors, and they, they have different amount of uh, impact on different countries, which is indicated by the unit specific factor loadings. So that's the interactive fix, fixed effect term coming in. And so mu zero is the loading for the treated unit and mu i, i from one to n are the you know, loading for the control units. And then we have an error term, epsilon it that have mean zero and the conditional mean is equal to marginal. So that's my setting. And for simplicity, I'm going to ignore measured covariance and we'll talk about that later. So, you can see that this is essentially just a factor model where the shared latent factor lambda t changes over time. And this lambda t has an impact on almost everything. So it impacts the treatment indicator in the sense that it influences who gets treated, when does treatment happen. It impacts the outcome for every single unit here. And each impact has a loading that's in the index, like indicated by mu i. And then over time, the outcomes for each unit may be weakly correlated due to the fact that the error terms can be weakly correlated over time. So this is the structure of the data that we're looking at. Under this interactive fixed effect model, you can easily derive what's the model for the potential outcome. I'm going to use the typical notation Y with parentheses, where xt can be either 0 and 1 to denote the pair of potential outcome for West Germany. That's the two West Germany that I want, right? y1 and y0. And just for simplicity, I'm also just going to talk about w with parentheses, although you don't really need that later. My main focus is y1 and y0. So for the treated unit, in the pre-treatment period, nobody is treated, so I observe the y under no treatment, which is y0. And based on the model, you can see that it's equal to mu0 lambda t plus the error term. Whereas in the post-treatment period, I'll add a beta t because x changes from 0 to 1. So that's the extra term. Now you will see the causal effect is defined as the difference between the pair of potential outcomes. And that's exactly beta t. That's my target parameter that I want to estimate. And I'm going to leverage information from the control unit. And this control unit is never impacted by treatment. So you'll see that W is equal to W0 and it's equal to W1. Implicitly here, there's an assumption called no interference in the sense that the fact that West Germany, reunification happened to West Germany does not impact the outcome in the US. So there's, they're not, the outcome for the control units are, oops, I keep, uh, forward. Uh, the, the outcome for the control units does, is not impacted by the treatment given to the treated unit. I want to pause here and ask if there's any questions so far. Does the model look uh, like it makes sense? All good? Okay. So how do I estimate the causal effect? The causal effect is difference between y0, y1. The problem is in the post-treatment period, I only get to observe y1. 
So I need to find a way to impute Y0. And that's why I go all the trouble and create a clone West Germany. But how do I create that? So we're, we're going to construct a clone West Germany or AKA synthetic control. And the idea is I'm gonna use the information from the control units by taking a weighted average of the WIT. Then I can just take the contrast between the two potential outcomes. So in the figure, you'll see that this is all about the potential outcome under no treatment. In the pre-treatment period, I do observe that for the treated unit, but in the post-treatment period, it's missing, and I want to impute that. And the way I do it is to estimate some weight such that it can match the pre-treatment outcome. So let me say that again. I'm going to take a weighted average of the control units. That's the dark, darker gray line. And the weights are tuned such that in the pre-treatment period, the two lines, the two trajectories, they match with each other. So the rationale behind this is actually very simple. If I go back to just one, two slides, back to the um, model here. In the pre-treatment period, when nobody is treated, my observed outcome for the treated unit is approximately this latent or unmeasured confounding effect. Similarly, the observed outcome for the control unit is also approximately this unmeasured confounding effect. We know that one way to control for confounding is through matching. So if I match on the pre-treatment outcome, then approximately I matched on the unmeasured confounding and that's a way to account for it. Of course, there is a reason that it works that way. And this is a key assumption called existence of a synthetic control or existence of such a match. So we assume that there exists a set of weights called alpha, such that the loading for the treated unit is equal to the weighted average of the loading for the control units. Here, we have. We, well, I'm gonna introduce a notation called a donor pool, because if I wanna create a cre um, clone West Germany, not all the countries are similar to West Germany. Why should I include all of them to create a West Germany? I want to pick the countries that are similar to West Germany. So not all the control units are part of the donor pool. So this D index a subset of the control units that serve as donors. And essentially this assumption says that I can match the unmeasured confounding effect on the treated unit with the unmeasured confounding effect of a weighted average of the controls. And that motivates the synthetic control method. This is a key assumption because under this assumption, you have this following equation it looks literally like a regression. And that's why, you know, and I'll talk about that later. So under this assumption, you have we have that the outcome for the treated unit in the pre-treatment period is equal to the synthetic control I want to construct plus some residual. So a natural way to estimate the weights alpha is just to run a regression. I can regress the pre-treatment outcome trajectory of the treated unit on the, all of those uh, control units in the donor pool. And that gives me an estimate for the weights alpha. So essentially pre-treatment, I run a regression, estimate the weights. And then in the post-treatment period, that allows me to create a synthetic control. Then I take the contrast that gives me the treatment effect that evolving uh, in the over time. Here comes the simplest question in my talk. This method tend to be inconsistent. And why is that? Yes. Is there any way you're dealing with the latent variable? Yes. So we're dealing with the latent variable in the way that I'm essentially canceling out the latent variable through this, this relationship that they, they are matched by like a weighted average. And that gives me uh that gives me this equation that holds. But if I just run a regression of y on w alpha, the regression coefficient will be inconsistent. And it's because of something about the residual. So in this residual, you wanna say something? Okay, so in this residual, see there, there are, there's a bunch of weighted average of epsilon it. Epsilon it are the error term for the regressor. So essentially my regressor are correlated with the residual. And we know that that's a violation of the assumption for linear regression. And you will get a inconsistent estimate for the regression coefficient. Now, I want to highlight that this actually does not conflict with the original work in 2010, because in the seminal work um, by Abadi and others in 2010, they assumed something similar, but slightly different. So we assumed that the underlying population level parameters mu i's 
they match with each other. But this 2010 paper, they assumed matching observed data. So because of that, they don't really have this issue. And they also focused on finite sample uh, problem, whereas we are looking at the, the scenario where t goes to infinity. So now uh, this, this problem has been mentioned in the paper in 2016 by Furman and Pinto and uh, in 2018 by Powell. And there have been a few methods proposed to solve it, but a lot of them rely on very stringent assumptions. Here's our solution. Let me summarize the problem. So in the pretreatment period where nobody is treated, I essentially have the following relationship. The unmeasured confounding effect on the treated unit can be matched by the unmeasured confounding effect on the synthetic control. If I get to observe lambda t, then I'm done. I just I already have a equation. I can solve for alpha from this equation. Everything is observed. But the problem is lambda is unobserved. So one way to solve it is I want to find a proxy of lambda, something that's slightly mismeasured version of lambda, and it satisfies the following assumption. So I'm going to use dt to denote this proxy. It's independent with all the outcome of all the units condition on lambda t. So zt, yt, wt, they're all associated through this factor model with lambda t, but that's it. There's no direct relationship between zt and yt, wt. If you have such a proxy, then you have the following equation that's looking very similar to the top one, except that I'm replacing lambda t with zt. zt is measured. I know where I have data on ZT. So this implies that I can construct an estimating equation from which I can solve for my parameters alpha. Once I have alpha, I have synthetic control and then I can calculate the causal effect. This strategy has been called proximal causal inference where you look for a proxy, that's where the proximal come from. So let me do a little ad advertisement on proximal causal inference or AKA PI because I'm super excited about this line of work. So the proximal causal inference has um, been a around for a, a while, but it's recently popularized and I have been devoting a lot of my time on it. At the beginning, we were thinking about methods around a type of variable in causal inference called the negative controls. It has been used to control for unmeasured confounding. And the idea is negative controls are some variables that are known to have a null relationship. So it's either a null relationship with the treatment or outcome. So it's either something not impacted by the treatment or something that does not impact the outcome. And because I know that they should have null relationship, if there is bias from confounding, I can detect that. And using some method, I can even and correct for that amount of bias. For a long time, we thought you have, always, you have to always search for a negative control. Until recently, we found that those negative controls are readily available to you among the measured covariates because measured covariates, they're never perfect. They're essentially kind of a proxy or mismeasured version of the underlying uh, true unmeasured confounding mechanism. So we call them proxies and we developed a lot of methods in different settings of causal inference. There are different ways to think about the proximal causal inference framework. In the synthetic control framework, the idea is when you have proxies like W. So remember we said in the pretreatment period, Y and W are essentially mismeasured version of the unmeasured confounding, right? When you have such proxy, instead of directly, it might be tempting to just run the regression because it's a mismeasured version of lambda. So I just regress on a mismeasured version with lambda up to some measurement error, then I can estimate the coefficient. But instead of doing that, a better way to do it is to find another set of proxy and create a unbiased estimating equation. Because we show that, you know, uh, if you directly run regression, it's gonna be inconsistent. So that's the key idea of proximal causal inference. Now here's uh, a one page summary of our proposal. The first three assumptions are what have already been um, assumed in the uh, sensitive control literature. Let me look at what I'm doing. How am I doing in terms of time? Okay, good. So the first three are the assumption required in the classical uh, synthetic control method. And we make the following two additional assumptions. First one is you can find such a proxy 
which we already talked about. And the second one is a completeness assumption. It's actually not a very strong assumption. And it basically says that because Z and W are both related to lambda, so they're related to each other through lambda. And I want it to be very strong relationships such that Z is very informative of W. And any, fine, any small variation in W can be recovered from through variation in Z. And that's how I find the underlying variation driven by lambda T, the latent factor. And completeness, it actually holds in a large class of models such as exponential families, uh, location scale families, and so on. So under those assumptions, we have the following identification result. So first of all, in the pre-treatment period, I can identify the weights that allow me to construct a clone West Germany through solving this equation. And in the post-treatment period, with the identified synthetic control, I can take the difference between the actual West Germany and the synthetic West Germany. That allows me to identify the causal effect. So far, you might have been wondering, where can I find such a proxy? One of the reasons that I'm super excited about this work is because in the synthetic control settings, um, the proxies are readily available. So let me talk about why that's the case. There are two examples. The first one, and is the one that I use most frequently, is that not all the control units are selected into the donor pool. There are some countries that are not similar to West Germany. For example, in the, West Germ uh, you know, in the German reunification example, only five out of 16 control countries have been used to construct the synthetic control. The other 11 countries, we do have data on them, but they're not used. We didn't really use them in the classical synthetic control method. But those data that are previously perceived as unusable, you can actually recycle them because they are exactly the proxies. So one type of proxy is the data that are pre previously discarded and which is the control units not in the donor pool. There have been a lot of work that's proposed to select the donors, then the rest of them would be my proxies. Also, you can just randomly split the set of control units into two, one half for the proxy that you use to construct the S-mini equation, and the other half you use to construct the uh, synthetic control. Another example is that sometimes a control unit may be declared invalid. For example, when the uh, no interference assumption is violated, such as there are some neighborhood country that are actually impacted by this German reunification, then they're no longer control units. So those units can also be used as a proxy ZT. So actually there are a lot of options for using, for selecting the proxies. Any questions so far? Okay. Now I'm going to talk about identification estimation for both the synthetic control weights and the causal effect. We already showed that by theorem one, you can identify the synthetic control weights by solving this equation. And that motivates a uh, moment restriction where I put any function of ZT on the outside. And in the inside, I have a residual. This is a classical kind of instrument multiplied with the residual situation. And this can be estimated by the generalized method of moments where G is a vector of arbitrary functions, you just need the dimension of G to be larger than the number of parameters, number of alpha. Here's a simple comparison between the classical OLS and our method. The only difference is the instrument part. So in the OLS, your estimated equation looks like this, where in the outside, I have the outcome for the control units in the donor pool, whereas for our method, we use the outcome for the control units out of the donor pool. And the reason is this guy, condition on lambda t, the latent factor, is independent of everything on the right-hand side. So that means the mean of the estimated equation is zero, so I can unbiasedly estimate my parameters, whereas they are totally related to each other, correlated, so the mean is not zero. In terms of estimation of the treatment effect, similarly, I have identification result here, and I can do that in the post-treatment period comparing observed outcome and the synthetic control outcome. And the problem is at each time point, I only have one single realization among all the units. So of course I need to borrow information from across time. For example, I can assume that beta t is a function of time that's indexed by a you know, finite dimensional parameter gamma. Now I can in fact, 
simultaneously estimate both the synthetic control weights and the causal effect using GMM by stacking all the estimating equation together. For example, here is one version where we assume that beta t is just a constant. And in fact, you can very simply run it in using off-the-shelf software packages. For example, in R, there's a package called GMM, and you can just run one line of um, code that gives you the point estimates and uh, inference results. Another nice thing is if you look at the, um, you know, the early time, the synthetic control methods and their application, there's never a confidence interval because the method does not uh, naturally lead to a statistical inference. Whereas for our method, uh, it's very uh, natural to have a formal statistical inference in particular. Um, so we have consistency and asymptotic normality well established with GMM estimators. And you can estimate the asymptotic variance using the HC estimator, if you assume the error terms are independent over time, you can use the hack estimator if you assume the error term are weakly uh, associated uh, over time. Another thing we want you to highlight is we realize that you can put a time series view at this causal inference problem in the sense that turns out the post-treatment difference between the observed outcome and the synthetic control outcome is actually a time series. So here, beta t can be viewed as a deterministic trend over time, and rt is just the, the difference between the error terms. So it's a mean zero weakly dependent stationary process. This opens the door to a rich literature in time series analysis that allows you to flexibly estimate the causal effect in the synthetic control setting. This framework is actually far more general. I mentioned before, I'm going to come back with a measure covariate and you can adjust for it. Another thing is you can apply it to not just one treated unit, but also multiple treated units by applying this method multiple times, but also accounting for the fact that some of the parameters are um, shared. The third thing, which is what I'm most excited about is we realized that the classical model is actually one special case of a non-parametric identification. So we extended this to non-parametric identification that allows for um, binary count outcome, non-linear model of any type, which is rarely studied in the literature. So let me talk about the idea behind non-parametric identification. Let's go back to that equation that we were thinking about. Why does it give me inconsistent regression coefficient? So yt is equal to weighted average of wt plus some residual. And if you look at this uh, part, you can think of it as a function of w. And essentially this line of equation is making the following assumption, which is the confounding effect on outcome is equal to the confounding effect on some function of w. It doesn't have to be a linear function, it can be any nonlinear weird function of w. All I need is a bridge. We call this function a bridge function. It bridges the confounding effect of lambda t, the unmeasured latent you know, factor, on the outcome for the treated unit and the outcome for the control units. That's what we need. And that motivates our non-parametric identification. For example, if I have count outcome, I run a Poisson regression, and then the bridge function would be exponential of weighted average of the uh, outcome for the control units. Here's our result. I'm going to you know, scratch out two assumptions because they actually imply the following two assumptions. The first one I deleted is the interactive fixed effect model. It's a linear additive model, but it doesn't have to be that. So this model in, in fact implies the following two assumptions. One is latent ignorability in the sense that conditional lambda t, the treatment is independent with the potential outcome for treated unit and control units. This model also implies no interference, as we mentioned before, where you know, the treated, treated units intervention doesn't, doesn't impact control units. The second assumption I'm gonna replace is this existence of a synthetic control, where it's essentially saying that effect of lambda t on yt is equal to effect of lambda t on a linear combination of wit. Instead of linear combination, I'm going to replace it with any old function of that wit. And under those assumptions, I have the following non-parametric identification result that allows you to identify the causal effect without making parametric assumption on the outcome models. So number one, I can still identify this bridge function under, of course, the completeness and those other assumptions that we previously listed by solving this equation, mean of y minus h given z is equal to zero. Previously, it was uh, just a weighted average of w you know, sitting here. Secondly, the causal effect, 
still mean of yt1 minus mean of yt0, it's equal to instead of having the weighted average synthetic control, I have a nonlinear function of w. So this is a very general situation, and it expanded the whole literature from linear additive model to any type of outcome model. Any questions so far? Okay, I'm going a little bit too fast. So here's some simulation. This might help you understand the structure a little bit more. So we're going to uh, include the uh, major covariates. For the treated unit, I have uh, a binary indicator for the treatment. The true causal effect is a constant that's equal to two. I have latent time varying factors that's following this distribution with a deterministic trend and a, you know, a normal random error. I'm going to generate either one, five, or 10 such latent factors. So lambda is of dimension one, five, or 10. And then the factor loadings follow the, have the following relationship. We call that there's an existence of synthetic control assumption. And this is exactly a setting that satisfies that assumption. The key thing in this special case is that the loading for each control unit only covers the confounding for one component of the treated unit. So you really do need all of the control units to control for the entire amount of confounding bias. And then we have the major covariates following standard normal distribution and some coefficient. This eta is equal to either one, which means there is some major covariate and you want to control for it. Or if it's equal to zero, it means there's no, major, sorry, there's no major covariates that you need to control for. And we're going to let the error term to be either independent over time or weakly correlated over time. In the literature, uh, a lot of the method that deal with the inconsistency problem, they assume independence over time and across units, whereas we don't really need to assume either of them. So here's the first result. We're looking at the bias and coverage, comparing our method and the classical OLS. The uh, hollow, well, it's hard to see which one is hollow. So the first three is, are the OLS followed by the PI, the PI method. So you can see from the x-axis and we're having increasing number of control units. And you can see that in a very extreme case, the OLS estimates will be really inconsistent. And the left panel are when you don't have major covariates and on the right hand, the dashed lines are the uh, bias from um, our method where you, you have major covariates, but you don't account for them. Whereas the solid lines are the bias where you do adjust for major covariates. And you can see that adjusting for major covariates does improve efficiency with the narrower bar. And in terms of coverage, there can be 0% coverage for the traditional method under this setting. Whereas for our method it's typically around 95%. So to summarize, the PI method gives you small bias, valid inference, and it's more efficient if you have major covariates and adjust for them, whereas the classical method have large bias and really poor coverage. This is a simple scenario where the error terms are independent over time. Um, I'm not going to go too much details in here, but the, it also works when the error terms are weakly correlated over time. It works when you have time varying co like coefficient or the time varying causal effect as a function of t with two parameters, in intercept gamma zero, uh, slope gamma one. It also works when you have count data with nonlinear models. And here I'm only listing the, the result from pi method. In, uh, at least from what I know, uh, I might be missing some literature, but there's not a method from synthetic control Of 1990 German reunification example, we have data between the year of 1960 to 2003, and we have measured uh, information on both West Germany, the treated unit, and 16 control units. You might not be able to see them; these are their light gray dotted lines. And the outcome of interest on the y-axis is the per capita GDP. The treatment of interest is, of course, the re reunification that happened at the year of 1990. We further have three major covariates that are called inflation rates, industry, and uh, trade openness. 
So in this figure, you will see that I have this uh, black solid line, that's the actual West Germany. I have the red line, that's the synthetic West Germany from our method, and the blue line is the synthetic West Germany from the 2015 paper that utilized essentially a OLS estimate, although under some constraint that the weights are positive and sum to one for better uh, interpretation and uh, regularization purposes. So how do we get those lines? In this paper, um, only five out of 16 countries were chosen into the donor pool. They are Australia, Japan, Netherlands, Switzerland, and USA. I have no idea why they're similar to West Germany, but that's the countries. And the other 11 countries were given zero weights. So what we're gonna do is we will take the five selected countries as the units to construct a synthetic control and take the rest of them as our proxy to create unbiased estimating equations. Here's the result. What we found is that there's a causal effect of negative 1200 US dollar, which basically says that after the reunification, Germany could have done better, but they actually have a GDP that's lower by $1,200. And we have confidence interval, either assuming you know, time independent uh, you know, error terms and correlated error terms that are all giving you significant uh, result. Whereas for the uh, previous paper, the estimated effect is negative 16, slightly larger in magnitude, but you don't really have a confidence interval following them. Now, how do I know it's working? How do I validate this result? Is there, is there any way that I can check that this method is actually working? Here's one idea. I know that in the pretreatment period, there shouldn't be anything going on. So if I just restrict my analysis to the pretreatment period prior to 1990, and I'm going to create a placebo reunification, then I know that after this placebo reunification, the true causal effect is zero. So I'm gonna look at how much are they diverging or different from zero. And I think of those numbers as you know, the amount of bias or variation. What we see is that our method estimated a causal effect of 125 US dollars, but the confidence interval does cover zero. And the uh, previous or traditional method got a uh, negative 243, so approximately twice the uh, magnitude of our method. Again, no confidence interval. So this gives us some confident, com some confidence that this uh, pi method is actually working. So I'm going to summarize. The first thing is this OLS-based traditional method can be inconsistent, particularly uh, under the assumption of existence of you know, synthetic control and large T uh, regime. And our method provides consistent estimator and value inference, allowing for a bunch of things. Number one, the error terms doesn't need to be independent across units. They don't need to be independent across time. And the latent factors can be either stationary or non-stationary. We can adjust for covariates and we allow for non-parametric identification, which, uh, which um, allows you to run synthetic control methods for not just continuous outcome, but also binary and count outcomes. And we also provide a new view at the post-treatment difference between true West Germany and uh, synthetic West Germany as, by looking at it as a time series data. So I believe that's all. And lastly, I'd like to acknowledge my uh, wonderful collaborators, Dr. Wang Miao, Eric Chicken Chicken, and Meng Tong Hu. And this work is funded by the NIH. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shu, for the wonderful talk. Are there any questions? I'm going to open this up to the audience. Are there any questions for Shu? Yes, please. So, in your analysis of the unification, Data. So, do you mm -hmm. get confidence interval for your coefficients? Um, yes. How, how do you um, use them? Or uh, you may have touched on that at the beginning, but what was mm -hmm. the eventual goal of doing this study? Yeah, so eventually we wanted to know if there's any impact from the re reunification on West Germany's uh, economy. And this is, well, I should say this one. It gives policymaker an idea of you know the amount of impact in terms of GDP. Uh, I work more in the health policy research area where um, a lot of practitioners, they are looking at typically when there's a policy given by the, uh, 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 you know, the uh, insurance program of the U.S., like the Medicare, Medicaid, um, 
that they are starting with the program on a, a few hospitals and then they see if it works if it works then they're going to spread out to the entire nation in that case uh, we're really looking at whether this new policy works at the first hospital and if it's a yes then we're going to apply it national wide and in that setting we really do need um, the statistical inference to guide uh, decision making yeah so the negative interval indicates West Germany lost a bit of lost a bit of GDP compared to the situation if there had not been any reunification. So that's the counterfactual world where there's no treatment happening. Yeah. So you mentioned something about this choice of these five countries. Like, what's the deal with that? I and mean, why those other? Has That's a good question. Mentioned in the paper, right? That's a good question. So in this paper, what they did is they have a kind of constrained uh, regression where they say, okay, all the weights need to be positive and they need to sum to one. And then in fact, all the countries are given a positive weight, but some of them are given a weight that is very close to zero. So they just threshold it to zero and take the five with really large positive weights as the the donors. So I think that's how they got it. And I have, and those are the countries that have significantly large uh, weights. So it was some data driven way to select them, not like some ad hoc, like something they said that these are the good countries. There are something done in that way by practitioners that they, they sometimes start with a filtering of, okay, these are the countries that I'm definitely gonna, not going to use. Uh, one particular example is in another study where um, policymakers evaluate the impact of um, the California tobacco uh, cessation program. Uh, so California is the uh, the treatment state, and there are a bunch of control states. Massachusetts is one such state that actually found that, well, this program is working, so I'm going to mimic it. But the moment they mimic it, they become a treaty unit or a, a violation of interference. So they are impacted by the decision at California. So that state becomes an invalid uh, uh, control unit, so they're not part of the donor. So there are a lot of um, prior knowledge involved in selection of uh, synthetic control in practice as well. Yeah. Really nice talk. Um, just a quick question about uh, when you choose the proxy, and then it's to satisfy the condition dependence uh, conditions. Yeah. So how do you actually check that? Because the, the, your condition on latent variables. Right? That's right. How the latent variable confounded? So I assume that somehow those latent variables are the common cause of uh, what GDP for different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, because the latent. Uh, they're also possible that the variable includes a variable that actually come in fact of the GDP. Actually, the common cause, common uh -huh. fact of the GDP. Oh, I see, yes. So the mm -hmm. common fact, you actually create an additional correlation between the proxy yes. and the outcome by conditional yeah. the common facts. Right. Well, yeah, if there are common effect of the proxies, then that's like a collider and you condition on that, it creates bias, right? So um, that's a more complicated scenario. So in the in those papers that the data driven method, what am I going? Uh, so the paper that I listed in the bottom for selection of control units here, I think they did more of a data driven way by really looking at, you know, for example, in the pre-treatment period, who are similar in terms of outcome trajectory through the uh, treated unit. Uh, in our proximal causal inference framework, we're currently developing a test using uh, methods in causal discovery from a kind of graphical model uh, standpoint to actually uh, scan through a bunch of candidate control units and identify control units that satisfy the, the factor model structure. Uh, I'm going, I'm always going the wrong direction, but you know that factor model structure. And the key idea is that uh, all the observed data have a covariance matrix and the sub-covariance matrix have certain structure if it's, it follows that, um, that figure. So there are certain tests that can allow you to detect um, proxies that we're developing. Yes, thank you. I have a sort of a naive mm -hmm. question, I guess, for you. So when you construct a synthetic control, why do you only just focus on the pre-treatment period? Mm -hmm. and my question is motivated by this. Suppose you do yeah. have covariates, okay? And mm -hmm. let's say in the more 
regular simple man's world of causal inference let's say mm -hmm. you don't have time getting data or anything right mm -hmm. you're trying to always mimic the same idea the counterfactual for the control right? yes right using borrowing information from neighboring observations through the access right mm -hmm. the covariate so suppose you do have covariates observed in the post treatment period yes. greater than t0 right so why not try to borrow the control information Mm -hmm. for observations with similar excels but in the yeah. post treatment period and not just focus on the pre treatment period to do oh, the synthetic control i see you can potentially do that i think it's a new idea and <laughs> <laughs> so you can potentially do that i think you can do that um two things i wanted to mention one is uh well i keep going the wrong direction so the original synthetic control method proposed by abadi and others in the 2010 paper, they they really literally used the matching idea where I'm going to match predictors of West Germany and control countries. And by predictor, I mean outcomes in the pre-treatment period because they are predictor of post-treatment period outcome. And another predictor would be the major covariates. So you can literally match all of them together by a regression kind of procedure. So that's one thing. The other thing is in our method, you actually don't have to restrict yourself to um, pre-treatment period. Let me go to that. So here I have a you know indicator of x needs to be equal to zero, which indicates pre-treatment period where I used to estimate alpha, right? You can literally remove this term. You can remove one minus xt. But in that case, you are saying, okay, my estimation of the weights, and then you can add on the uh, you know the the major covariates cit times the coefficient so literally you're saying i'm estimating alpha borrow information from both pre and post treatment period right. and i'm also estimating the causal effect borrowing information from across pre and post uh, you know uh, right. treatment period so you can actually do that um it will be it will be more efficient but it's not very similar to the synthetic control kind of flavor so that's why we put it uh, this way okay yeah I have a good question. Mm -hmm. In your uh, Germany, Western, West Germany data, yes. is, is the response variable or GDP adjusted for inflation? That's a good question. Inflation is a major covariance that, that we adjust for. That's a very yeah, good question. It's a, it's a covariance, but yeah. the response variable. Uh -huh. response variable oh. It's, you know, in 1960, 1960 and now the dollars are very different. Yes, I think in their uh, appendix, they have a list of how they uh, measured those data. And I think the definition of GDP is inflation rate adjusted. Okay. I need to double check it, but I vaguely remember there are some comments about that. Yeah. Are they adjusted? So, so it doesn't look like they're adjusted. It doesn't look like so? No. Okay, let me double check the paper. I think they have some comments about how they calculated the GDP. I think they said something about, you know, adjusting for inflation. Yeah. No. It doesn't look like it. It's too too going too fast. Hi. Yeah. Oh, okay. Then no. <laughs> yes. I have a question. Uh, so, uh, when you didn't present, uh, when you earlier you mentioned that uh, you worked on the last two years. Yes. So, uh, do you require the pre treatment time to be very large? Yes. So, That's a good question. Yeah, I have a question, especially for the media model, right? Uh -huh. For the index model. Because in that case, if uh, you actually get large T, you can actually estimate the data from this. Uh, so, uh -huh. uh, so in that case, then you can regress all those participants, and maybe you don't actually need those uh, possible uh, because then you can get right. a lower major calculation. That's actually. right. That's right. I think the underlying assumption might be slightly different or slightly stronger than what we require here. Although you can do that, yes. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, so I guess like, there's two different kind of directions, right? Because, mm -hmm. like, you don't think in that case, you don't need, you don't need the positive. You don't need positive. You don't need that uh, assumption for. Uh, right, right. I think the uh, underlying assumption is slightly different. Also, it relies on kind of more linear model where yeah. when we move to uh, non parametric. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just go back to the, the, the data again. So, yes. Suppose you go back in time and uh -huh. give, give your parents the conclusion that there is this possible loss in GDP that's going to happen. Maybe. 20, 30 years down the line. Do you think that's the, because you're only looking at GDP, but would it be meaningful to look at other indexes of well being or things like that? Mm -hmm. so, so, my question is if you go back and provide that information, I mean, it's not a 
super surprising conclusion. So if that information was available back then, it still would have possibly happened, right? Uh, the unification. So in, in, in your other applications, I mean, is that something you think about? Like, so let me say back to you, see if I understand the question. So uh, back in time, the other time varying factors are already indicating that reunification will happen. And then, then what was the question? So the question is, so, so you have your conclusion that there is this <laughs> potential loss in GDP that's going to, that has happened because of that. Yes. So if that information was available back in time, would it have changed the outcome mm -hmm. of the implication taking place or not? If it was... A bit. So some so God told me, you know, in a few years, reunification happens and your GDP is going to go not as fast as it's supposed to be. Would that would that change the would that change my future outcome? I mean the you can imagine that the unification would still have happened, right? Uh, yes. The information was so, right. So you mentioned some other applications where your uh, interested in doing this kind of what if uh, analysis. So, mm -hmm. so is there like a threshold that if the loss is beyond with this threshold, mm -hmm. we do things differently? So is there an aspect like that? Potentially, that's a great idea. Well, if you have kind of prior knowledge of forecasting what's going to happen in the future, it might inform number one, decision on treatment, number two, future outcome. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions for sure? Yes. In the time interval before 2003, there were other big events, mm -hmm. like uh, many Central and Eastern, Eastern European countries joining NATO or joining EU. Mm -hmm. So yes. they could be equally important. Are there studies that consider those? <laughs> I think, yes. So this reunification problem has been studied by a lot of e economists. And um, I think that has been looked at. I remember there was some um, explanation of the little bump right after the re reunification, but I don't know, remember the details. I think those are considered by more kind of uh, practical uh, research, uh, not in this one, but that should be considered in the future. Yeah. So on the GDP, the last two weeks' events mm -hmm. showed that those NATO expansions and other have a more negative impact on Yes, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are there any other questions for sure? So you've just done a constant beta. Did you treat that as a time series? It seems like the effect might not have been constant over the subsequent years. Right. So you if you if you want to estimate the time there well the constant beta is just for illustration um you don't have to do that and you can literally just estimate the deterministic trend using time series method and it's time varying yeah yeah it doesn't have to be constant right but you didn't do that again i didn't <laughs> okay are there any other questions for sure well, if not, let's thank her again. Thank you.